Hello and welcome to the Atoll, your home for Waterworld fandom. In today's video, I want to explore and just give some appreciation to what is probably the most ultimate piece of Waterworld merchandise, the Waterworld pinball machine. So without further ado, let's insert some quarters and get those flippers warmed up because only with great skill and fast reflexes will we be able to sink the Ds and find the fabled dry land. But to get started, let's quickly talk about pinball in general. Now, the history of pinball is a whole other subject on its own, but I was surprised to see just how far back you could trace the origins of these machines with the so-called spring launchers that were invented as an alternative version to billiards in late 18th century France. Pinball entered its more modern era when British inventor Montague Redgrave patented, innovated, and began manufacturing his own version of the spring launcher in 1869. Fast forward to the 1930s and we begin to see the first coin-operated machines being created by David Gottlieb, who founded the first major pinball manufacturing company. Let's keep that name in mind for later. As pinball evolved through the 20th century, the machines became more and more elaborate, introducing electrification and active bumpers with player-controlled flippers and then eventually introducing circuit boards and digital displays. Even for a time, pinball was banned in New York City from the 1940s to the 1970s with the mayor at the time claiming that pinball was a game of chance, essentially a form of gambling that was targeted towards children. Even though pinball saw a dip in popularity during the rise of video games in the 1980s, the phenomenon survives to this day with enthusiasts for the old machines and even new machines being manufactured every year. But interestingly, even with its long history, the 1990s saw the best-selling pinball machine ever created, that being the Adams Family Pinball, which moved 20,000 units, kicking off the era of movie-licensed pinball tables. And I think the popularity of these movie tie-in machines totally makes sense, because it allows players to quickly become immersed in the lore of the machine, which can be difficult for machines with original themes that need to tell a whole story from scratch. And this is of course where we arrive at Waterworld Pinball, being released in 1995 by none other than Gottlieb, the company responsible for the very first coin-operated machines. Now, at this point, I think we should take a tour of the board and look at some of the defining features of Waterworld Pinball. Let's begin with the back box. At the top, we of course have the back glass, which displays our hero, the Mariner, and our villain, the Deacon, with a cropped-in image of the Atoll engulfed in battle in the background, an image that we've seen in other various tie-in merchandise. Moving down to just below the back glass, we find the digital display, which presents our progress and score, and gives us some wonderful little animations to accompany the different accomplishments in the game. From what I've seen, these animations include references to pure dirt, the harpoon gun, the water cannons, the tracker sharks, and even the urine purifying machine. On either side of the display are small speakers emblazoned with Enola's tattoo. And speaking of audio, though the machine has great sound effects and music that really captures the intensity of the game, unfortunately they are not adaptations of sound effects from the film or James Newton Howard's Waterworld score. But with that said, all of the vocal callouts are from the Deacon himself, blurting out lines like, Dry land salvation, room to grow, fire the harpoon, smokers attack. And yeah, I could not find any information about this online, but I don't think it's actually Dennis Hopper's voice, but regardless, whoever the vocal talent is, they totally capture the maniacal nature of the Deacon by constantly taunting the player who is assuming the role of the Mariner. <laughs> Moving down the cabinet, we of course have the main play field, which is sort of divided into two halves, the above water consisting of this large atoll structure and trimaran, and the below water with the skyscrapers of the underwater city reaching up from the depths. 
And within the underwater section, we can find a variety of sea life, including eels, octopus, and a swarm of whale fins, which are oddly mislabeled as trackers. However, on the lower slingshots, we do get a shark, presumably a tracker shark, as well as this orange manta ray. Also hiding in the depths is this smoker with a cobbled together firearm, which I strongly suspect was traced from this production still. However, check this out. Since the smoker is underwater on the pinball board, he has been illustrated with some scuba diving gear, a very nice bit of detail that could easily be overlooked. Moving back up the playfield, we have an array of features including members of the smoker armada, like this mohawk smoker riding a jet ski that flips up and down, the hellfire gunner on this rotating wire form arm that redirects the ball on the upper level, and even the smoker scout plane makes a small appearance here on this decorative panel. Smokers can also be found printed on the various targets in the playfield, and this image of a silhouetted smoker may be familiar to you as it's a production still that has found its way into quite a bit of Waterworld merchandise like the collecting cards. Making our way to the top of the playfield, we have the game's main feature, the Atoll, which can be accessed by the center wave ramp that flips the ball up onto the raised platform. And amazingly, the atoll can flip and become the smoker's lair, known as the D's, during certain modes of play, which I'll cover in a minute. This rotating feature is a real showstopper and adds a lot of unique razzle dazzle to the whole presentation. The sides of the cabinet are also emblazoned with the triangular Waterworld logo, surrounded by the gnarled jumble of materials that make up the atoll flotella. All in all, it's a very attractive machine, and one that certainly visually captures the excitement of the film. And I have to say, I've always been fascinated by this pinball machine, and over the years I've actually acquired a few Waterworld pinball collectibles, such as this small promotional flyer that displays the machine and the Waterworld logo on the front, along with the line, Dive into the world of pinball. On the back side of the flyer are some nice close-up photos of the playfield along with the physical dimensions of the game and where you can get more information about it. Also in my collection, I have this keychain that utilizes the Waterworld Triangular logo. And you're probably wondering, what's that got to do with the pinball machine? Well, these keychains actually came with the keys to open the machine's front coin door, and the individuality of each machine's keychains would allow arcade owners to easily organize all of the keys for the machines that they owned. It's actually a pretty cool little piece of collecting, especially knowing its very practical purpose within the world of arcade management. But by far, the most exciting piece of Waterworld pinball collecting that I have is, of course, this authentic back glass that I acquired some years ago. Taking a closer look at the artwork here, you can see that there is a ton of detail in this image, and I love how the Waterworld logo works Enola's tattoo into the design. And check this out, the Deacon has this really creepy sunken eye, which lights up on the actual machine. It makes me wonder if the game designers took some inspiration from the Terminator 2 back glass. But regardless, this is just such a spectacular item to own and I hope someday to create a backlit frame so that I can display it more properly on the wall in my apartment. But at this point in the video, you're probably saying to yourself, sure, the machine looks great, but how do I rack up a huge score on it? Well, I was not prepared for how much depth there is to the gameplay in these 90s pinball machines, but I'll do my best as a self-proclaimed novice pinball player to sum up the main goals and modes contained within this machine. First, I want to bring our attention to this 3x3 window grid here on the main underwater skyscraper. This grid is one of the primary ways to access the different modes and build score as it offers skilled players a lot of flexibility and strategy to work with. 
any currently blinking grid insert can be collected by hitting the dive hole when that also becomes lit. This will give the individual awards labeled next to each of the inserts such as collecting dirt or a jackpot, but upon connecting any three solid inserts in a line, either horizontally, vertically, or diagonally, will allow you to enter the sync the D's mode, which will rotate the atoll feature, transforming it into the D's. Now to finish up this multi-ball, the player must hit the center wave ramp and load three balls onto the top of the boat. Hitting any switch on the board with a fourth ball will tip the D's releasing the multi-ball and giving all of the main shots a jackpot, which if all shots are hit, will light the super jackpot target. And yeah, I think for any novice or even intermediate player, achieving the sink the D's multi-ball is a real thrill and challenge. Though, with that said, there are tons of other modes and goals within the game, which I'll quickly review here. As mentioned above, players can collect dirt, which will give them a bonus score at the end of each round, or it can be exchanged at the trading post, which can be accessed by hitting the full left orbital twice, and depending on how much dirt you've accumulated, will give you different awards including jackpots, multiballs, or the coveted super multiball. More on that in just a moment. And apart from the Sink the D's multiball, there are a slew of other multiballs such as Standard Multiball, Berserker Multiball, or Battle of the Atoll, all which can be accessed through the features award windows on the grid, which by the way have selectable left and right branching paths to give even more depth to the gameplay. Also, apart from dirt, there are a couple other collectible items. Players can collect all the letters of Waterworld by hitting the wave ramp when the spell insert is lit and you're in a multiball or hurry up mode. Once the entire word is spelled, players then can activate the Waterworld hurry up round, which allows them to rapidly acquire another collectible, map segments. Map segments can be collected by hitting the left orbital when the add map segments insert is lit, which can also become activated by the big score award window or by hitting the tracker targets. Collecting three map segments will allow players a chance to go to dry land. Dry land will permanently light the super jackpot target for about 20 seconds, allowing skilled players to hit it multiple times and rack up huge score. And these hurry up modes just seem so nerve wracking to me given the ticking time mechanic however, there is this insert, Deacon's Eye, which will extend the time on any hurry up mode by hitting the center wave ramp. But beyond the multiball and hurry up modes, we still have quite a few other goals, many of which have a unique Waterworld flair, such as Watchtower. This allows players to build score through hitting the left orbital and then collecting that score by hitting the right orbital. Harpoon, a slightly hidden and hard to hit leftmost kicker that when activated gives a random award which can range from small bonuses to larger things like automatically filling up all of your map segments. Water Cannon, this gives a bonus score by hitting the target to the right of the harpoon multiple times. Hellfire Gunboat. This can be accessed through a feature award window and is sort of a gambling mode that gives players the opportunity to continuously hit the left orbital followed by the dive hole, then decide if they want to collect the given award or shoot again for another option. And again, these are just some of the other modes contained within the Waterworld Pinball. It's just amazing how deep this game is and how many unique and standard goals there are to go for. But before I end this section, I of course have to talk a bit about Waterworld's Wizard Mode, or known specifically on this machine as Super Multiball. For those unaware like I was, Wizard Mode, indeed named after the hit song by The Who, is a very difficult to achieve mode that can only be accessed through completing a long series of difficult tasks. In Waterworld, this mode can be achieved a few different ways but the main route is by collecting all three features at the bottom of the awards window grid. Hydro can be collected several different ways. On the left path of the features award window, 
by lucking out on a random harpoon award, or by adding it to your treasure chest via the Die for Treasure mode. And yes, getting Hydra will give you the urine purifying machine animation. Dry land we discussed previously and can be achieved by filling out all of your map segments. And finally, four corners can be collected by lighting the four corner windows of the award window grid. However, it should be mentioned that Super Multiball can actually be collected two other ways, exchanging 30 dirt at the trading post or by completing the Hellfire Gunboat Gambling Mode. But regardless, once in Super Multiball, you will have three balls to juggle as you attempt to hit the Super Jackpot target, which will become permanently lit during the duration of this multiball. However, once you've drained back down to a single ball, the game will resume as normal. And yeah, from what I've gathered, these are the main features of the Waterworld Pinball. The pro tip I kept seeing over and over again when researching was to hold off on entering the Sink the D's mode, as the game becomes much more difficult after this mode has been achieved, making it hard to collect the other features that are needed to progress towards the Super Multiball. Now I have to shout out YouTuber and Twitch streamer AKM's Pinball who had an excellent VOD on his channel describing the nuances of Waterworld Pinball and an entire written guide posted to Pinside.com. Links in the description to both of those great resources if you wish to go even further into how all the different modes work on this machine. And at this advanced point in the video you're probably starting to ask yourself, but Atoll, have you ever played the game for yourself? Well, that's actually a bit of a tricky question because Gottlieb the company went under a year after Waterworld Pinball came out, meaning that it's one of the last games manufactured by the legendary corporation. This also means that Waterworld Pinball is actually quite a rare machine, with only about 1500 produced. And learning this makes me feel a bit guilty about buying the back glass for my personal collection since purchases like that will only drive up the price of parts for actual pinball enthusiasts that are keeping these relics alive and running. However, I knew this video would not be complete without playing Waterworld Pinball for myself. So, after some research, I found the closest location with a public Waterworld machine was about a three hour drive from where I live on the seacoast of New Hampshire all the way up to Bangor, Maine. It was a bit of a trek, even a pilgrimage if you will, but the anticipation to get my hands on the actual machine only grew as the miles passed under my car's tires. And yeah, I was greatly pleased to have finally arrived at the promised land, Queen City Cinema Club, and was greeted by its owners Joshua and Tiffany Moulton. And with great expectation, I turned the corner into the main game area and finally laid eyes upon the machine for the first time. This meant only one thing. It was time to grab some quarters, queue up the Tom Crusher remix, and get those flippers fluttering. Yeah, it was wonderful to be able to finally play the game for myself. There's just something so mesmerizing about all the intricacies of this machine's gameplay and presentation. As far as my skill level with playing the game, well, let's just put it this way. I can see why pinball was outlawed as a game of luck at one time because for me, that's totally what it is. But even with just flailing around and occasionally making a nice shot, I could still really appreciate all of the mechanical and electrical design as well as the visual artistry that went into creating the game. 
It's a game with a surprising amount of depth for skilled pinball players, but if you're like me and just interested in seeing the machine as a fan of Waterworld, I think you'll still also be delighted by all the small details that have been taken from the film and translated down into pinball form. And yeah, a huge thanks to Queen City Cinema Club in Bangor, Maine for letting me hang out and film myself for this video. Links to their website and social media in the description below. And yeah, even with the rarity of this machine, I would totally recommend seeking out and trying Waterworld Pinball for yourself. There's just something so mystical about the physical presence of these machines that can only truly be understood by experiencing it for yourself in person. But there you have it, that is my deep dive into Waterworld Pinball. If you enjoyed this video, please consider giving it a thumbs up and also let me know if you've played Waterworld Pinball for yourself. It's always a treat reading all of your thoughts down in the comments and for me, it's really the payoff for creating these videos. And of course, subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. There's a large back catalog of videos to explore and more planned for the future. Also, follow the Atoll on Instagram for even more Waterworld content or to reach out to me personally. But with that, thanks, as always, for joining me at the Atoll.